So the UFC just released a video titled UFC Vegas 11 Fighters You Should Know and in my opinion that video should be renamed UFC Vegas 11 Fighters You Already Know because we know who Mackenzie Dern is, we know who Ryan Spann is, fair play with the Randy Costa pick but even then we still know who Randy Costa is but still respect for the Randy Costa pick UFC. I appreciate that you're giving him some kind of spotlight but what the hell were those predictions? Ryan Spann? We know. Mackenzie Dern? We know. She doesn't need an extra 100,000 Instagram followers. This is the video where I'm going to be telling you guys the fighters to really watch out for at UFC Vegas 11, giving you the top prospects on the card that you may not have heard about yet. You may have if you follow the sport close enough, but these are the people that really need a boost and a bit of a spotlight going into tomorrow or this weekend's card. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself going into this weekend's card because listen, people need to build their profiles and there's a lot of young talent on this card and I'm going to start with Miguel Beza. I can't believe this guy was not on on their list like we need to shine a spotlight spotlight on these people the main card is overshadowing everyone on this card so I'm going to go through the prelims Miguel Beza is one big name that sticks out to me massively he's undefeated 9-0 taking on a guy in Jeremiah Wells who's 8-2 and who's not the best opponent in the world and is taking it on short notice as well now he is dangerous, and of course, he could go out there and catch Miguel Beza on a chin. That could easily happen. However, Miguel Beza has been given a real good opportunity here. First of all, this might be a tougher fight than Mickey Gall, who Miguel Beza was originally supposed to be fighting on this card. Miguel Beza versus Mickey Gall was signed. Mickey Gall pulled out of the fight, which, to be honest with you, I was expecting because this was literally the end of Mickey Gall's career. The writing was on the wall. Miguel Beza is going to improve to 10 0 with a big showcase win against Mickey Gall. But now he's taking on Jeremiah. Wells, which is a, a bit more of a dangerous fight there, I say. 8-2, and two, better record than uh, Mickey Gauls. Beat some good opponents as well. 3-1, 18-5, and 11-4, and 6-2. He's taking this one on short notice, however, which is going to give the edge to Miguel Beza. And I think Miguel Beza would get the job done anyway. But still, this is a good opportunity for Miguel Beza to go out there and get another dominant win like he has done so far throughout his career in the UFC. He won his fight on the Contender Series against Victor Reyna, who was 10-3 and three at the time. He's beat some other guys 5-2. Uh, now he's had an amateur career, sorry. Jesus, that, that resume is not too stacked with great talent, but 10-3, and 4-2. and two, He just beat Matt Brown as well, which is a good win to have, especially because Matt Brown came out in that fight against Miguel Beza and looks really switched on. In fact, I thought, you know what? Miguel Beza has not really been tested so far. I think Matt Brown's going to KO him in the first round, and I picked Matt Brown as a bit of an underdog there. Matt Brown almost KO'd him in the first round, and Miguel Beza showed that he can get through the adversity. And as an undefeated fighter where you have not faced any adversity so far in your career, to see that he can bounce back against a savvy veteran in Matt Brown after rocking Miguel Beza in the first round, Miguel Beza comes back and puts it on Matt Brown in the second and shows his youth and shows a bit more fight IQ than we've seen from him before. I liked the performance. I liked the fact that he dealt with Matt Brown because I still feel like Matt Brown's danger for a lot of the guys in that welterweight division right now. And now Miguel Beza is going to go out there and beat Jeremiah uh, Wells, in my opinion. I like Miguel Beza. He's a dangerous, dangerous striker. He finished a guy with leg kicks before in the UFC in his first fight in the UFC, his UFC debut against Hector Aldana. Now, again... That fight was a short notice replacement. It's a real tough time for Miguel Beza to get his hands on someone that he's actually been scheduled to fight other than Matt Brown. So I feel for him a little bit, but I still think he's going to go out there, get the job done in impressive enough fashion. He's got very clean striking. He's got good distance management as well. He's a very rangy guy for the division. I think he goes out there and gets a big KO win. However, he has not fought too many great guys yet, so he's still a little bit of a work in progress. But if he does get a win this weekend, I am sold on Miguel Beza. So pay attention to him. Not to mention he's had five fights as an amateur and won every single one of them, as I said before, and many times in these videos. If you have an amateur career, it tells me that you're planning to be a UFC fighter. If you just show up and become a pro, you're poor and you need money. Like, if you have an amateur career, you don't care about the paychecks for now. I just need experience my career. That shows me that you're forward thinking. You're really t paying attention to your career and you're really taking things seriously. I think Miguel Beza deserves a spotlight. And I'm giving him that spotlight because he is my main fighter to watch out for on this card. However, moving on throughout the card, TJ Laramie is another fighter that you guys need to watch out for on the card. He's coming off a big win on the Contender Series not too long ago. In fact... Just over a month ago against Daniel Swain. Now, Daniel Swain was 20-9. and nine. He wasn't the best fighter in the world. However, TJ Laramie, although it was a rib injury finish, and I know some people could say, ah, it wasn't a real finish. 
It was a real finish, though. Daniel Swain did have a rib injury, don't get me wrong, but TJ Laramie looked like he was starting to take over that fight. Then you look for his career, he beat a guy 5-1, and 7-3, and three. he's lost some fights as well, but 25-6, and 7-4, and 5-2, and two. like he's... He's beat some decent enough guys, not too much higher level opponents yet, but then again, he's only 22 years of age, and to see this amount of activity from him as such a young guy proves a lot to me, not to mention he didn't have an amateur career, which is why I'm going to excuse some of those losses, even though I love to see an amateur career, this guy has not had a single amateur fight, he went straight into the deep end against a guy who was 12 and 12. Now, I know it doesn't sound like a good record, but when you are 0-0 as TJ Laramie, and you take your debut against a guy with who's 12, 12, and 4. You know? You're talking about a guy who has 28 professional fights. And you have zero. And you go out there and beat him in the first round by TKO. You know, like, it's just a good sign, and he goes off to the races, he's been chinned a couple of times in his career, he's lost a split decision in his career as well, but I still think he's got the momentum right now, he's looking better than ever, if you go back and watch some of his old fights, he's somewhat unrecognizable, and he's got a good opponent in Derek Minner, who, as much as I respect Derek Minner as an opponent, is a little bit of a jobber, coming off a dominant loss to Grant Dawson, and before that, who did he beat? 15-3, and three, Charlie Dubray. You know, that, in my opinion, doesn't earn you a UFC contract, but apparently the UFC thinks otherwise nowadays because they're literally signing anybody in the hopes that maybe that one random guy will get a big upset KO on one of their cards. I actually don't know why they're doing this because they're just making themselves look worse and they're losing prospects. They always seem to. Instead of just postponing a fight, let's just find some crazy guy to go out there and beat our prospects, like with Roosevelt Roberts. Stop getting these people hurt, okay? It's dangerous to take these short-notice wild men, and I respect... This matchup for TJ Laramie, Derek Minner, although I believe TJ Laramie is going to go out there and get a dominant win, Derek Minner is a dangerous guy, you know, against Grant Dawson, he survived for a bit. Now, I know that's probably not what you want to hear, but he survived for a bit against Grant Dawson, okay? He was on bottom, he had some tricky situations, Grant Dawson put him in some tricky situations, and he managed to find his way out of a few of them. I know this is not the best selling point for Derek Minner, but still, I think it's going to be a good test. A veteran with a lot of experience. He's lost some good guys as well, including Kevin Kroom, who I just mentioned, by the way. Kevin Kroom, the guy who just KO'd Roosevelt Roberts. I swear to God, I wasn't even supposed to say that, but Kevin Kroom's on his record as a loss. So Derek Minner lost to Herbert Burns as well. No shame there, but lost to Grant Dawson. Herbert Burns' loss is looking a little bit worse nowadays since the old Pineda situation. I'm sure you'll agree, but still, Derek, Derek Minner... Um, I'm, I bet he wishes he could turn that first letter of his surname upside down. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case in his career so far. Uh, 24 and 11. I think I'm going to go with TJ Laramie here. And I'm looking forward to seeing him throw down because he's a dangerous guy. He's got a lot of good technique. And I think he gets the job done. Not to mention 22 years of age. If he wins this one, take it as a blessing. Stay a bit less active and come back in six months when you have a bit more of a complete game because you're just going to be a sponge at this point in your career. And I think he goes out there and looks dominant. Derek Minner is just not a really good opponent, in my opinion. Like, he lost to Grant Dawson pretty dominantly. Like, I feel like TJ Laramie is going to be able to go out there and do something similar or maybe win a unanimous decision against this guy. I just feel TJ Laramie gets it done. He's a young prospect. He's very talented. And I've seen enough from Derek Minner to know that maybe he doesn't get this upset. But we'll see what goes on. I'm going with TJ Laramie, another guy that you need to pay attention to. Moving on up the card, David Dvorak. 28 years of age, a flyweight contender. I mean, we don't get many new flyweights on the block. But recently, we seem to be getting a lot of new flyweights around. So I'm looking forward to this one. He's taking on Jordan Espinosa now. This is a weird one. On the fighters to watch out for on the MMA Guru channel. Because I'll tell you this. I picked Jordan Espinosa to win this fight. Because I think Jordan Espinosa is going to win this fight. I think Espinosa's too rangy. He's too good. He's too experienced against good competition. He's coming off a great win against Mark De La Rosa. Although it's Mark De La Rosa. He looked very dominant and won every single round. And he looked very crisp and better than we've ever seen him before. I'm sure you'll agree. Jordan Espinosa looked great. I think he's going to go out there and beat David Dvorak. Mainly because... David Dvorak did not look amazing in his debut against Bruno Silva, who was 10-4 and, and not really a credible name. Don't make it look close against him, please, David Dvorak. And also, David Dvorak showed a few holes in his game in that fight against Bruno Silva. I think I'm going to go with Jordan Espinosa, but I still want you guys to pay attention to David Dvorak because you're talking about an 18-3 and three guy who's fought a bunch of times in his career. No amateur fights, but straight into the pro scene. Lost his first fight. That's what you get for not taking amateur fights. Uh, beat two guys and lost another one, but then beat some more in the Gladiator Championship fighting. We don't even know 
what record these guys have, that's how good they are. They're off the scale of records, okay? They've gone so far up. They've prestiged, basically. That's the equivalent. If you don't see a record next to a guy's name, you may be thinking, you know what? Maybe this guy's a complete can, and they didn't want to share the record because he's so bad. They've actually prestiged, and they're on a different level, okay? So I'm giving a lot of credit to David Dvorak. I'm joking, guys. But still, keep it serious. He's beat some good guys. 8-4, and 4-0, 9-4, 12-6, and 16-2 and two to get himself into the UFC against Tay Gubov, which is a great win. He won it by finish as well. I don't think he beats Espinosa, but if he does win, he's a young guy. He's pretty marketable. He plays chess. I, I know that about him. I'm not too too aware of the guy, to be honest with you, but he's a great fighter, he's got good technique, and right now, we need flyweights, okay, we need flyweights to be paid attention to, because the division is clinging on for dear life, I pray to God that Divas and Figueredo beats Cody Garbrandt coming up soon at UFC 240, 255, 255, Figueredo versus Garbrandt. I hope that Figueredo beats Garbrandt because if Garbrandt wins, he's going to ditch the division and look for a super fight and the whole flyweight division is going to be ruined. I don't know why the UFC have done this. However, if Figueredo does win, the flyweight division is right back on track. You've got big names. Brandon Moreno. I want Sergio Pettis to come back. I'll be honest with you guys. I want Sergio Pettis back in the cage and that's final. But you've got guys like Kai Cara France right now, Brandon Moreno, you know, Alex Perez. There's a lot of guys right now in the flyweight division, and I think David Dvorak would be a great addition to that list. And if he does win this one, I would love to see a David Dvorak versus Tim Elliott next. I think that would be a great matchup, and the winner of that fight would then move on and get their shot against someone in the top five. Are you on board? Thank you for watching the video. Um, it's a, I like it. It's a great card. But I just thought I'd pay attention to the people that actually need to be paid attention to. Because listen, UFC. Let me just type in now. Mackenzie Dern's in... Oh, it's recommended to me. What do you know? Mackenzie Dern's Instagram. Um, I could have just pressed a little shortcut. But, you know, I thought I'd type it in to keep the mystique. Don't know why it's not loading, though. And that was a very loud clap. That was great connection on that clap. The mic actually might be broken from that clap. But that was great connection from that clap. I've got to be honest. It won't load up Mackenzie Dern's Instagram page. Have I visited it so many times within the past 24 hours that I've been permanently locked out of her Instagram? Who knows? But she has a lot of followers. And why is it not loading for me? That's the big question. I may have lost internet connection in my entire house right now. I'm going to keep passing powering through in the hopes that my video is still recording. Mackenzie Dern has a lot of followers though. That's my main point. Here we go. 801k. Why are you putting a fighter who has 800k followers in a fighters you should know video on YouTube? You could have promoted Kevin Holland, Darren Stewart, who are also on the main card, or anyone I've listed in this video. Where are your priorities? Getting Mackenzie Dern an extra no followers because everyone already knows who she is. Or really propping up some of these young talented prospects. Thank you for watching the video. Like and subscribe. Click that button there. And good bye.